So I'm not going to go over details of the syllabus with you line by line on the first day of class. What I'm, I've done is I've uploaded it up to Canvas. Take a look at it. Make sure you go over the policies. I'll mention a couple of policies that are, are my pet peeves. Cell phones out on the desk? No. Um, I just want to have a good interaction with us. I know that when I'm at a meeting and I don't want to pay attention, my cell phone's out on the desk. And I try not to do that because it's really disrespectful for anybody who's conducting that meeting. And right now, I've left my own cell phone in the office because I have an awful habit of looking at my own cell phone. So it's coming from a personal thing. Um, the second thing, I think, um, is coming late to class during a quiz. Um, and that's because it disrupts the quiz. Some people are started, and I'm rapping, trying to pick up papers and shuttle your quiz to you. So um, if you come in late for a quiz, that counts as a drop quiz. So you just wait till everybody's done. And, that's what, and we always have quizzes at the beginning of the period. There's a couple important highlights that are different probably from any other professor that you've seen. And the first one is how I grade. I grade with a rubric on each question as you go along. And I've uh, actually not surveyed students to ask them if they like this or not, but my sense is that they do like this because you know upfront how you're being graded as you're taking the, the quiz or the test. And you will see some of these questions reappear. So it's um, once you see how they're being graded, you definitely have a second chance at getting them correct and looking at the cut up of the grade. A lot of the times I'll tell you how I'm going to place that rubric before I even give you the quiz. So um, I, in my opinion, I've seen that students seem to like it. I, no one's complained about it. Um, It's right on the test. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Here's what, an example of what it looks like. You get the question. You believe you can't do this for proofs, but you can do this for proofs. So you get all the breakdown sitting right next to you. And there's usually a point allocation to it, too. So you can actually see where the points are being allocated. The second important highlight, this is really interesting. Um, some of you, I'm going to look through this and find out you're going to go into teaching. When I first taught, I taught at West Point, um, fresh out with my doctorate. And West Point had a policy that they don't have office hours on the same day as an exam or a, they called it written proficiency, proficiency record. They always had a WPR. Um, so they had a, a case that you don't have any additional instruction, which is office hours, on um, the day of an exam. And as a new grad, I thought this was awful. When would someone think about their exam? It'd be on the day of the exam, right? Well, as I've got gravitated through my career, I've realized that um, helping students right before an exam is actually bad. Usually students wait till the last minute, and they're just desperate questions, just here's my mind, where's the mind to mind transport, let's put the suction cups on, and let me see how much I can suck out of you in that last few minutes. And I'm stressed out doing that. And it, it, that was not even my fault. You know, I have things that I am late on that are my fault, and I should be stressed out about those things, not your things. So I feel like I'm not going to judge you for what you do because I do it too on certain things. But I think you have to take ownership of making that choice. It's your choice. So how my help works is I usually help. I'm very, very helpful. Um, but it can become less and less helpful the closer that the quiz or the test comes up. And on the day of, I'm, I'm not going to even be available for that. Physically, I'm not available for that. All right, um, your book is really small. How, does anybody have the book in here? Yeah, the little Dover book. Um, somebody mentioned they were in uh, real analysis or advanced calculus. Have you noticed the, the books start getting smaller? Uh, they're still expensive, but they get smaller. Our book is not expensive, but you remember the big calc book, right, yeah. with all the details in there? Well, the reason that the books get smaller is that the idea is that you're supposed to fill in the gaps. And as mathematicians, we know that. We kind of learn that as a rude awakening in our upper level classes and in graduate school. But as we continue that process, we forget that somewhere along the line, we learned we have to fill in the gaps. And you may not be continuing on. So it's something that we learn over time. And um, I wanted to show you how to read the book, because it's not the same as reading your calc book, where they have little boxes with the important information, and they have the sample problem, and then you do the monkey see, monkey do, back and forth, and make sure you got it. Um, it's not like that. So they have a bunch of words. If you look in your 
I, I'm sure advanced calculus is worse. You look in there, there's it looks like a bunch of words, and they're like, there exists, for all, all these words are put together, and it looks daunting at first. But what you need to do is dissect it apart. Sometimes there's examples. So in Underwood Dudley's book, there's examples in there, but sometimes there's not. If there's not an example, when you read a definition, try to think one up. So you ha the reading's actually really slow. You have to read the page and figure out an example. And even if there is not, not an example, fill in another example yourself. And this is really, really more important in classes like advanced calculus and abstract algebra. But you see that here, too, that you're going to have to fill that in. And if you can't think of anything, that's when you contact me. Say, I've read this definition. I have absolutely no clue what it means. Can you help me construct an example? And I'm pretty good at walking you through that. There was someone, uh, a, re a researcher here named Dr. Fuller. He's not here anymore. But he used to work on um, understanding what students think about in proof writing classes and comparing that to what the professors think. And I, I thought his talk and his research was really interesting. Um, When, stu when we think that students have to fill out the examples, because we know we have to fill out the examples, and that's part of learning, but when students were surveyed, they don't think that's their responsibility. They think it's the professor's responsibility to give them those examples. So um, that's why I'm telling you, as you're reading the book, you want to fill in these examples. And the more you make up yourself, the better and stronger you become. And it's not the same as when you're in calc and they start showing you every little example. And Another thing is that they didn't realize that it actually contributes to their learning. Because up to this time, everybody's given you the example. So they didn't understand, the students that were surveyed didn't understand that it actually makes them learn. That's how they learn. I had an interesting story to do with this. Um, um, it's about Professor Song, actually. Um, he actually had uh, solutions to Calc too, And I had a bunch of his students sitting outside on the table. And they were just scraping. And I came out there and said, what's going on? And they're like, we have the solutions, but we have no idea what they mean. He only gave us like two lines. And um, I looked at it, and indeed, he had given them two lines. It was the answer, but there was no clue at how he arrived at it or anything. And so I, I went and asked, I went and told him, look, there's a bunch of students out here, and they're frustrated over the solutions. You know, they're asking why there's not, the gaps are not filled in. And he goes, I left them out on purpose. I want them to fill in the gaps. And I asked him, did you tell them that? They might want, need to know that you expect them to fill in the gaps. They're thinking of it as a solutions manual and why I'm not, I, I'm not understanding what you've written here. So I think that's, um, that's a little bit of this going on in just our own, own um, department. So here's what I mean by um, developing examples. Two divide six. So I make up an A and I make up a B. A divides B, so I choose two numbers, two does divide 6. A divides B. And I go to the next part. If there is an integer D such that A, D is equal to B, what well, is there an integer D such that I can take that A and multiply it to the D and get this number here? And the answer is yes. The answer is D is 3. Um, I'd like you to look at this definition right now and try to just make up five examples on your own of two numbers that divide each other and come up with something that fits this definition. <laughs> 